break anything? All right. We probably better go ahead and go live. By live, I mean sound. <clears throat> Let's start. Well, welcome to Oak Hills Community Church, all 16 of you that are here and all 250 of you who are not. Uh, we're glad you're here. We're going to start by singing, uh, what was that song we we're going to do? <laughs> Victory in Jesus. That's what we're going to do. Let, maybe we should pray first. <laughs> Let's do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and bringing each of us who are here at this physical location to worship you, but also those who are turning in on Facebook. Father, we pray that we would, our hearts would be focused on you to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's start that song. Go ahead and stand with us. To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus I say Oh uh -huh. 
blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Came for a cleansing of Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood power in the blood sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder-working power in the blood of the land there is power power wonder-working power in the precious blood of the land service to Jesus your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you turn to somebody and say, good singing. Thomas, come and give us our announcements. And y'all go ahead and have a seat. Yes, good singing, everybody. Thank you for joining in our worship this morning. Uh, it is a great privilege that we have to come before the Lord and to worship Him. I have just a few announcements to make today. Next Sunday is Father's Day. And we will be restarting our children's church during the service. For those of you that are listening online and you've been using that as an excuse not to come, well, your excuse is up. We will be opening the doors over here, and uh, your kids will be welcome to come and stay there. All right. Uh, also, out front in the uh, lobby area out here, there are some CDs spread out on the table there. Pastor Mark has donated those. They are free for the taking if you would like them. And then on Saturday, June 27th, we have a newcomers class. If you're new to our church, if you want more information about our church, if you'd like to learn a little bit about our church history, about our beliefs, and if you are interested in possibly becoming a member, this is your opportunity to take the newcomers class. Uh, the class will be led by Pastor Mark. And I understand that uh, Mr. Hawkins back here, Mark Hawkins, is going to be serving breakfast to go along with that. So I hear something like pancakes, eggs, sausage, that kind of thing is going to be served. So uh, that ought to get people to come in, even if you're not a newcomer, right? <laughs> All right. So that's coming up Saturday, June 27th. And worship team, back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. I'd like to read a short passage from Psalms 145, starting in verse 9. <clears throat> the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. And I think I started one verse too late. I did. Let's back up to verse 8, which was why I picked this section. Let's back up to verse 8 of Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He, is com his com he has compassion on all he has made. 
All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing, Great is, thy, great is Your Faithfulness. That is not right. That is the wrong. Your grace is enough. Wow, I really need to go back to bed. You guys can take over. I'm going, no, no just kidding. Your grace is enough. I am just going to have to think a little harder or something. I know. It's, it is the best song ever, right, Don? <laughs> Is enough. 
wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Naught of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood. The King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever His truth shall reign. The King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever His truth shall reign. Exalted on high. He is the Lord, forever his truth shall reign. Heaven and earth, rejoice.
Christ in his holy name. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. Father, we pray that you would be exalted above all that you've created. We lift you up. We lift your name up. We pray that our praise and worship has been worthy of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all can have a seat. Um, normally we have a basket where people can put prayer requests in, but I have no idea if any put, anyone put any in. So let's just pray, and as you have things in your mind that you want to lift to the Lord, you do that, and uh, I'll just go ahead and pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you. You have brought us here. You have given us freedom to worship you. You have kept us uh, free from illness. Father, there are those, though, who you have allowed to be ill. Uh, our daughter, Maria, has had some sort of flu. Uh, it's been pretty rough on her this week. We pray that you would heal her. There are others, Father, that I know need your healing touch. I think of Kath Kathy Emery, and we're glad she's here, but we know that her body is wearing out, and she needs your sustaining power to heal her and make it easy for her to breathe and to get around. Father, you know of others that are on folks' minds, and, and as they're lifting them up, Father, I pray that you would work in the, in the hearts and the the bodies of folks to heal them, the hearts of, and minds of people to bring them to you. And Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Mark, would you come and bring a message from the Word of God? Good morning. Good morning. True spiritual progress in the spiritual journey seems sometimes to be elusive. It can be one major sin, or it can be a series of minor sins, missteps. It can be an extended time of dryness in our lives. We don't feel the presence of the Lord. It can be a series of setbacks, a roller coaster of ups and downs or zigzag. For all of us who have struggled in this and similar ways in their spiritual journeys, the story of the Exodus can be an encouragement to us. Consider this the Israelites had just experienced their miraculous liberation from the enslavement in Egypt and were headed to the promised land. God had parted the sea and rained down food from heaven. He had caused water to gush from the rock for his people. And yet, after all this, Israel found herself wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. GotQuestions.com got, uh, got gives some Q&A concerning this. Here's the question. Why was Israel cursed with 40 years of wilderness wandering? Here's their answer. Wilderness wandering refers to the plight of the Israelites due to their disobedience and unbelief. Nearly 3,500 years ago, the Lord delivered his people from Egyptian bondage, as described in the Exodus chapters 1 through 12. They were to take possession of the land that God had promised to their forefathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. Prior to entry, however, they had become convinced 
they could not oust the current inhabitants of the land, even though God said they could. Their lack of belief in God's word and his promises brought forth the wrath of God. He cursed them with 40 years of wilderness wandering until the unbelieving generation died off, never having set foot in the promised land. Let's take a step back in history and see how they got here. A seven-year famine throughout Africa and the Middle East was responsible for God's chosen people ending up in Egypt. Initially, they had flourished under the leadership of Joseph, the number two in charge of the country under Pharaoh. You remember the story about how he predicted this and he suggested to Pharaoh, you know, you need to appoint somebody with wisdom. And Pharaoh looked at him and said, you're the guy. And so he put him in charge of accumulating the wealth of seven years of prosperity and then distributing that wealth to keep the people alive during the seven years of famine. Well, regardless of this great benefit, which also brought his family to live in the area of Goshen in Egypt, in spite of this great benefit, later there was a pharaoh that rose that did not know Joseph. And as he saw the people in Egypt, the, that is the Israelites, multiplying and becoming just just tremendous in number, as God had predicted to Abraham, he became fearful. What if they ally themselves with our enemies outside, and here we have this fifth column in our, in our nation, they could take over the country. And so he felt like he had to do something in order to deal with this. And so he enslaved this whole race. He put them in slavery. He used them for the benefit of the Egyptian economy. He put them to the task of building cities and fortifications and storehouses and various works, public works. And they were worked hard and they were worked mercilessly until they cried out to their God. And God heard their cries. And he sent Moses and Aaron to deliver them from the Egyptians. And after enduring the last of the ten plagues, the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh finally agreed to release the Israelites. Upon their arrival at Kadesh Barnea, which bordered on the promised land, can you picture it? They're there on the promised land. They're looking in. God has been telling them for centuries, I'm going to give you this land. But they're on the border. And the people decide to send out 12 spies. It seems like a good idea, a little recon. Let's send out 12 spies. They spent 40 days traveling the length and breadth of the land. And they came back, and they, they did say initially, hey, it is everything God said. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's a prosperous land. It'll be a great place to live. But, boy, we just don't think that we can overcome those people. That was the report of the ten. Only two, Caleb and Joshua, held back. They didn't agree with that last part. But, believing the report of the ten, the people lost heart. And they rebelled against God's plan for them. They raised their voices and wept aloud, grumbling against Moses and Aaron, saying, if only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land only to let us fall by the sword? Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed among them? 
I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them. Expand on that. The text also tells Moses, I'm going to take you and I will use your descendants and I will make a greater nation out of you. Now, it would have been easy for a lot of leaders to say, okay, you know, they've been grumbling against me. They've even threatened to kill me. Sure, do that. Get rid of them, God. But I love Moses' attitude. Moses intercedes for the people that have threatened his life. And he prays to God. Here's what he does. He says, Lord, the Egyptians know that you brought your people out of Egypt. Lord, your reputation is at stake. If you destroy the people, the Egyptians will say, God wasn't able to deliver them. Isn't that great? His greatest concern is for the glory and reputation of our God. Good model for us. And you know what? I will just read between the lines and I will stick my neck out here. I believe God knew Moses would say that. I believe he intended all along to spare the people, but he used Moses to do it. It is interesting that there is a verse in Exodus that says someday God would raise up a prophet like Moses. Who is that prophet? Jesus. 1,500 years ahead of time, God predicts this. And he tells about this Savior that will come, that will be like Moses. What did Moses do? He stood in the gap. He represented people who deserve to die to God and brought their deliverance. What did Jesus do 1,500 years later? He stood in the gap and he took the wrath of God And because of what he did, people are spared. People are saved. Moses once again interceded for the people and took away the wrath of God. And God did forgive them. But he also said this, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their forefathers. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Rather, they would suffer through wandering in the wilderness until one after another after another died in the desert. Everyone 20 years old and up. And the only exception to that are the two who gave a good report, who trusted in God, who believed in God's word. God had said, you can do it. And they said, with God's help, we can do it. By the way, would you say that? With God's help, we can do it. Whatever it is you're facing right now, whatever difficulty, and they are multitudinous, aren't they? Transitions, business challenges, health, whatever the issue, God can get you through. That is so important to remember. God had promised them victory. The land he commanded them to go in and take was already theirs. They simply had to trust and obey. But this they did not do. Let me say this and underscore it. God will never lead us where his grace cannot provide for us or his power cannot protect us. That's on the screen. Would you read that screen with me? God will never lead us where his grace cannot provide for us or his power cannot protect us. True? I remember a time in seminary. I'd gone to Bible college and I'd been working my way through. I I had no one to support me, and it was a private Bible college, and so I worked my way through. I worked uh, every week and then extra on Christmas, sometimes had a second job. I worked full-time, sometimes had a second job in the summer 
all to pay off the expense of college. I had applied and been accepted to Dallas Theological Seminary at a master's level, but the cost was three times what I had been paying. And I'm going, I don't know. <laughs> Can I do this? The, the regimen of study will be at a much higher level. And the cost will be three times as much. And as I had that summer to think about it, I was working full time and I was preparing, I got really nervous. In fact, I remember going in, you had to take a physical as part of the inference application. And I took the physical and they said, do you have any symptoms of anything? And I said, well, my eyes are fluttering and twitching. I think we concluded it was nerves. Ever been there? I was nervous. I can't see a way how I can do this. Now let me back up. God provides for different people in different ways. Sometimes he has somebody just write a check. Sometimes he allows us to grow by working us. And he brings us through things. That was my case. I had worked in the grocery industry in two states, four different companies. Finally wound up with a company here in the Dallas area that um, it wasn't the best paying, but I continued to go back there year after year. And finally, I got to the point where I just had to show up. And they said, OK, Pylon, start on Monday. <laughs> and, uh, and I did. But as a result of doing the same job in the same industry and business, Year after year after year, my salary kept creeping up. And it helped. But I still couldn't see how I was going to be able to do it. When I came back for the final summer before seminary, I applied and they said, well, you know, we've closed this location, but we'll send you to another one. They sent me to another location. New boss, didn't know me. And um, he said, how much do you want? I gave him a figure. It was kind of high. He said, while you're working full time, I can pay that. But when you reduce to part time, we're going to have to cut your salary. I agreed to that. So I worked all summer at this high salary. And just before I started seminary for the first time, guess who got transferred? This boss that was going to cut my salary got shipped out to another store. And at the same time, there was a performance evaluation that I was going to be subjected to. Ever been through those? And they brought in a guy, a co-manager, who I'd worked for in past stores. He knew my work history. He knew I was dependable. I, you know, I had a Christian ethic and, and I worked hard and I was faithful. And guess what he did? He shot my salary up. <laughs> he gave me a great review, boosted my salary to the max that it could be. And that got me through seminary. Did God provide? Is that just a coincidence? I don't think so either. <laughs> The second part of Exodus, beginning in chapter 15 of the book, takes place at Mount Sinai. These chapters contain the more tedious sections of the book, but they are all about the details of God's law and the building and detail, great detail, of God's tabernacle. The fact that more than half of the Exodus, the book of Exodus, is taken up with these things should alert us to the fact they are central to the message of Exodus. The purpose of Exodus is to prepare God's people to become an independent nation under God and enter Canaan and set up their kingdom. The laws show them how they are to act 
as God's people. While the tabernacle showed them how they are to worship as God's people. These two things, how they should act with the law and how they should worship with the tabernacle, are the thrust of the majority of the book of Exodus. So this is a prominent theme. The book concludes with them constructing and finishing the tabernacle. Peter Enns says this, Exodus is the central book of the Old Testament. Israel begins its journey as a fledgling nation and is given two central components of their faith that will dominate the remainder of the Old Testament. Right behavior and right worship. Israel's repeated failure to live up to this standard will quickly become a common theme in the Old Testament, with the golden calf incident being a preview of much of their history throughout the remainder of the Old Testament. During the 40-year journey of the Hebrews from Egypt to Canaan, Moses went from Mount Sinai to Mount Sinai to fast and commune with Yahweh for 40 days. He received the Ten Commandments from Yahweh at that time. While Moses was gone, however, his followers, including Aaron, become nervous that he was taking so long, and they thought, we're never going to see him again. And so at the prompting of the people, Aaron casts idols. Now, isn't it ironic? Moses is up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, inscribed on stone by the finger of God. What's one of the commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Are they supposed to make an idol? No. <laughs> what are they doing down in the valley? <laughs> Aaron is busy casting an idol. <laughs> and he's saying, here are the idols, here are the gods, Israel, that brought you up out of out of Egypt, worship them. Wow. Moses saw the actual calf in the altar, and he became so angry, he hurled and shattered the two tablets. Later, God instructed him, and he followed through. He carved out two more stone tablets, and God re-inscribed the Ten Commandments on that second set. When the people complained they needed food in the desert, Yahweh fed the Israelites with manna. It's a Hebrew term that means, what is it? They'd never seen this before. It was a substance white like coriander seed, and it tasted like wafers made with honey. That doesn't sound so bad. And it said... In Scripture, it rained down from the heavens. God also provided quail for them. So what we have seen is that God was creating what he promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. What was it that he promised them? A nation. He promised to make them a great nation. And he had brought them right, right on the edge. And through lack of believing in his promise that they could do this, what he had commanded, they didn't get to experience it. And that was left for another generation. They didn't trust their God, even though he had answered their prayers, sent a deliverer, Moses, even though God judged the Egyptians with ten plagues, even though God protected them from those very same plagues, even though God delivered this generation with the greatest Old Testament miracle, the parting 
of the Red Sea. God brought them through, and the army that was pursuing them drowned. God provided them food. God provided them water. Yet everywhere they went, they were unthankful, constantly complaining, and did not trust God, even though they saw these great miracles. Picture yourself there. What if you saw? Would you believe? Now, picture this. God has poured out his love on you. He sent his son. His son provided an even greater deliverance. His death bought us life. He took the penalty I deserve and the penalty we deserve. The penalty was death. God's wrath was poured out and Jesus took the full brunt of that so that we don't have to endure that. We are set free from sin. We are liberated. We have this new relationship with God, even better than the one Israel had. They were called to be a nation. We are called to be God's people too, as sons. That's even better. So, how will we respond? Just as God was watching Israel, gauging her response, so he watches us today. How will we, his people, respond today? This week, this year, in faith or in fear? Now, I know that times are crazy. I meet people who are in difficult circumstances. As I was preparing this message, I met a guy who came in. His name is Paul. He's a Christian. He can't find a job. He has a number of adverse circumstances in his life. Life is tough. Life can be challenging. Can I get an amen? Life can be challenging, but God is with us doing life together with us. Let's depend on him. Let's put our faith and our trust in the one who delivered Israel and the one who has a greater deliverance even than that for us. Once we read the word of God, let's heed it. You know, I think about um, what are we going to do to acknowledge that God is at work in our life? And I think one thing should be very obvious that we should do, and that is we need to spend time with God. One of the ways we do that is to spend time reading his word. That's God speaking to us. I hope you have a time set aside, hopefully, each day. And I know some of you are incredibly busy. But even just a little time can remind us of his great love for us, can prompt us of his working in our lives, can help us to trust him in times of difficulty. Let's read the word of God. Let's not be like ancient Israel that didn't heed the word. Let's remember it. Let's treasure it up in our hearts. And let's do what it says. Let's live it out. Once we read, let's heed. Keep God and his word in our hearts. Remember that we are a new creation we are a new body with Christ as our head. We are new people 
created in Christ Jesus to worship our great God, the one who delivers us, the person who has given us great hope, a lasting future, and an eternal inheritance. When hard times and disappointments come, and it will for each one of us, will we continue to walk in faith or in fear by letting sin dominate us? Shape our attitudes and actions, sending us far from our Lord. (laughs) Friends, let's remember that in the hard times and the good times, let's remember this, God provides. Would you say that? God provides. God provides in miraculous ways. Looking back at Exodus 16, we read, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. A chapter later, he says, strike the rock, Moses, and water will come out of it for the people to drink in the desert. And it did. They were hungry. God sent manna. They were thirsty. God brought water gushing out of a rock. At a later time, they came upon water that was Bitter, they said it is mara. That's the Hebrew word meaning bitter. And God made the water fresh. God again and again and again proved himself worthy to look after them. And over and over, God provided for their needs. And just like the people of Israel, they had to look to God to meet their needs, to be refreshed by what he was offering. And they had to go out and they had to gather the manna each morning in the wilderness. And so it is with us. They couldn't store it up. They had to look for it fresh each day. If you've been living on the fact that God delivered you in years past, he may do a new work in your life. He may allow you to go through a fresh challenge just to keep you fresh, to keep you trusting in him. Because let's be honest, it's all too easy if things are easy. It's all too easy for us to trust in ourselves and forget about God. Think, I've got this. But when our back is against the wall and we're in the situation that we can't figure out a way, what do we do? We look up, don't we? And that's what God wants us to do. Now, sometimes we miss the miracles of his provision out of busyness or stress. We try to get things going too fast on our own, spinning around, trying to get it all done. Or other times we might start to forget what matters most. But even in those days, there is his grace. He waits for us. His provisions and blessings, they never run dry. Even today, his miracles lie right before our eyes. We just have to choose to look at them and stay close to his presence. Now let me give you a warning. Sin will always take us farther than we want to go. What if instead of looking to God for his provision, we do what the Israelites did and we quake in fear? And as a result of that, we don't read and heed. Sin can get its roots, its tentacles around our heart. And it can take us far, far away from our God. How did the people respond in the midst of all that God did for them, grumbling, complaining, sin, 
hearts far away from God, these were all too common for the Israelites in these desert wandering years. Often like us, they lost sight of how far sin could carry them down the road they never wished to go and that we never wished to go. God had mercy on them over all those years. They tested him even after he graciously provided all their needs and offered them protection and strength. They tested him. In Exodus 32, we read the story about how the people turned away from God when Moses seemed to be too long coming back down the mountain. Aaron, as I said, cast the gods. Here's what he said. He said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. The very people who had just watched God perform miracle after miracle on their behalf and guide them through the desert days were now bowing down to a golden calf they'd set up in place of God himself. How easily we often forget what starts with complaining and grumbling, hearts going astray, leads us deeper and farther down the path away from God. Sin gets a hold of our minds and our hearts. It's like a disease that we can't shake off on our own strength. But God, in his mercy, forgives and sets free. He redeems us from the pit that far too many of us have wandered in and been stuck in. He lifts us out and places our feet on solid ground. He gives us fresh purpose and hope. I don't know about you, but I'm glad for a God who forgives. I'm glad for a God who restores. Because I'm just like everybody else. I'm a person and I can be led down the wrong road. And I think we all can. Isn't it great to know that God rescues us? God resets our feet on the right path. God directs us. He's our loving Heavenly Father. I'm so thankful for him. We may have forgotten and left on our own, but God is always with us. God is always with us. Even after all these things the Israelites had done, how they'd wandered away from God, he said these words just a few verses later. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Isn't that a remarkable thing for God to say to these people, the disobedient people? My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. God's presence is it, it, powerful. It's strong. It is never dependent on how good we are. His faithfulness, even in our hardest struggles, is there. Only in him can true rest and peace be found. The years of desert wanderings must have been difficult to endure. Forty years is a very long time. Sometimes God doesn't work on our time schedule. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> yeah. But he never abandoned his people. There's great comfort in that. Think of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. Imagine the sunrise on the desert. People emerging from their tents, sleepy. They automatically glance over to the tabernacle to see what's up today. And the cloud has lifted. How would they react? We chuckle to imagine an irritated mother groaning, are you kidding me? Not again. Oh, think of all the packing I have to do. You know, God didn't leave Israel, even while they traveled in the desert. 
Just as God had led them with a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud during the Exodus, so now too. The cloud of God's presence was right there at their camp. And at night, God's presence was again with them. He made himself known through a pillar of fire. Imagine seeing God's presence made known all night with holy fire. They didn't wander in the dark. God provided light. And when God wanted them to move, the cloud began to lift. And Israel knew that was their cue. Time to pack up. Time to take down the tabernacle. God is moving us to a new location. This he did about 40 times during that 40-year wanderings. I cast my mind to think of the man in the next tent, slightly cynical neighbor who rolls his eyes thinking, eh, whatever, as he heads out to gather daily manna. Another tent away, there's a sick person who is struggling. I can't take this, she gasps. Please, Lord, make this stop or give me the strength to keep going. Make this stop or give me the strength to keep going. A beleaguered father, desperate for an end to the dust and uncertainty, immediately hopes, maybe this time, at last, we'll get to the promised land. And somewhere, there's the curmudgeon, still cranky about having to leave Egypt, muttering, this way, that way, all this moving and yanking about should have stayed in slavery. So many types of people, so many types of reactions, and yet not one is focused on the fact that God was literally in their midst, traveling with them, leading them every step of the way. Kind of makes me wonder, will it take me 40 years to learn that lesson? Father, King of Heaven, thank you for your presence. Father, you have come to indwell believers. You literally reside in us. You're not in a tabernacle. You indwell us. And Father, how easy it is to forget that. To just get caught up in the cares of the day. To forget about how you have provided for us. To not be thankful for all you've done for us, Father, which is just magnanimous in your grace. Father, we miss your presence too often. And as a result, Father, too often we are beginning to slide into sin. And Father, I pray that you would help us. You've given us a great word. You've given us a word primarily for believers, I think. It's the word repent. To some that sounds harsh, sounds threatening. But Father, I think that you gave that as a gift. You gave it as a gift to your children to help restore us in our relationship and our walk with you. Father, thank you for the opportunity of day-to-day -day forgiveness for the fellowship and family of God. Lord, help us to take up what you have given to us, the opportunity to repent from sin and to turn to you for restoring of that fellowship, for renewal of the joy of our salvation, which you offer. Thank you, Father, for that. Father, I pray that you help us to take up this opportunity to examine our hearts, 
and to repent and to remember that you are with us in your presence. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Amen. Mark, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, Psalm 98, starting in verse 4, it says, Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Be jubilant. Shout for joy and sing. Sing to the Lord with lyre, with the lyre and melodious song, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout triumphantly in the presence of the Lord our King. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing Shout to the Lord. I 
this I have in you. Remain standing for the benediction. From the words of Paul. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant us to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that we may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be blessed this week.